Good afternoon, Saitlanders, and welcome, after a long absence on my part, to Saitlanders, the week in review. I should perhaps begin by explaining my absence. When I was touring the USA for Saitlanders last year, deployed by Mr. Miller to do what uh, Departement Beitelands is meant to do, to liaise with the rest of the world on behalf of our cause. I uh, uh, experienced some illness and that occurred at exactly the same time as we had some problems with uh, videos. To make matters worse, we had uh, severe financial trickery being played on us, which severely hamstrung our ability to focus on things like videos. And last but not least, the lady who helps me with these videos, mom, passed away. And uh, so in all of that, the videos were forgotten a little bit and it went on like that. Uh, the tour lasted a long time, another two months. And, and really that was what preoccupied me totally. I came back to South Africa, was very busy uh, with all sorts of other things for about another six weeks after that. And by that time, the whole thing had just sort of slid into the background. Anyway, Mr. Miller has uh, instructed me to, to resume the videos. And it's my great pleasure to be back here again after a long time. I thought that for today, what we could do is uh, chat about some big events that have happened in the intervening period. And I've chosen four or five. The first one is speaking of the USA, as we have been. Then we'll go on to the Russo-Ukraine war, then the Israel-Gaza conflict, and finally the South African elections. So without further ado, speaking of the USA and the tour of the USA, I've been receiving many queries from people about what is going on in the USA. The simple, straightforward answer is that people fail to accept real life in the real world. In other words, there's what we call a normalcy bias. People have a bias towards normalcy, most people, most of the time. And therefore, their ideas of what the USA should be are informed not so much by what's going on now as Dallas, the television program in the 1980s and a favorite president or some big event in recent years or watching the Super Bowl or whatever the case may be. The reality is that the USA is changing by the minute and it's changing drastically. The USA appears to be an empire dying. We are witnessing in the USA the modern day equivalent of the collapse of Rome or the fall of Rome in 476 AD. And you can see it in many different things. For instance, young people's faces. Young people in the USA, I'm talking now of people between the ages of roughly 15 and early 30s, are all miserable. All of them. You don't see the sunshiny expressions that I saw on people's faces when I was a young man. When I was at high school and university and army and first jobs and hitchhiking through Africa up and down to Zanzibar Island to work as a dive master. Most people of my age over that period had sunny expressions. You see very, very little of that in the USA. All of the faces of the young people, with very, very few exceptions, are glum. Misery seems to be the predominant mood in the United States of America. On the other end of the scale, you see elderly people going back to work. I've told many people about a story, uh, something that happened to me. I stopped in a certain town in the north of the USA over, overnight, and the next morning I had breakfast at the local Denny's restaurant. It's a, a very, Denny's is nothing special. 
It's like a, I don't know, roughly like a McDonald's to us. A little bit better, more original menu, but the decor and the service and everything else is very standard, quick service restaurant style, as they call it in the USA. And I saw five employees in the time that I was there. The lady who met me to say, good morning, welcome, table for one. The woman who served me, another waitress, and through the serving hatch, I could observe two women, five people, five employees, and all of them were women beyond retirement age. That is indicative of how social security and retirement plans are not keeping up with the phenomenal inflation in the United States of America. And it's also indicative of the reluctance of uh, young people to work for whatever it may be, uh, $7 an hour, $10 an hour, $12, $15. Not only, but especially because of the cost of accommodation. Now you might say, well, you have to, if you're going to live in a, a place, one dollar is better than no dollars to pay for that rent. Yeah, but it's not working out that way. A lot of young people are going back home, moving in with their parents, and not taking on the full responsibility of transport, accommodation, uh, food, and so on. You also see in the USA at present a slight deterioration, I shouldn't exaggerate it, in the houses and the cars. When St. London's was last in the USA prior to the lockdowns, uh, the travel restrictions in late 2019, for instance, cars were on average 5% better looking. In other words, 5% younger, if you like. People are hanging on to their motor cars for longer. And it's, it's discernible, it's observable. Particularly in the north, where they put salt on the roads to give grip in icy weather. Which causes rust along the running board of the, of the cars over time. You see a lot more, uh, many, many more uh, badly rusted cars on the roads in the USA than uh, five years ago. Thursday, the 11th of April, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, the, the 12 Federal Reserve Banks that make up the Federal Reserve Banking System which is not federal, not reserve, and they're not banks. They're privately owned institutions that kind of print money or don't even bother printing it, just adding it to computer screens. Revealed on Thursday, the 11th of April, that delinquency rates on credit card repayments in the fourth quarter of 2023, that is to say October, November, and December of last year, are the highest ever recorded. Let that sink in. We'll talk at some other point about the debt of the USA, now at $34.5 trillion of the budget deficit of the USA, and so on and so forth. But let it suffice to say, to those people who've been asking me what's going on in the USA, there is really a very meaningful, slump and decline that is quite visible to the naked eye and quite easy to research that is having a hugely detrimental effect upon the economy, upon the people, upon jobs, incomes, and so on. On to the Russo-Ukraine war, I think that the salient thing to say is that Russia is crushing Ukraine. Today, Friday, the 12th of April, if any of you have been watching closely over the past, give or take, four weeks, 
then you will know very well that the Ukrainian armed forces are crumbling. They are now giving way. They are now unable to stem the Russian tide at all. But many people make the mistake of saying, yes, but if Russia is so big and so powerful and so strong, then how come it has taken Russia so long to do what it has done? And there are two mistakes in that. The first is the assumption that every war should be over in a day and a half. This war, which began on Thursday the 24th of February 2022, that is to say two years and not quite two months ago, is not an exceptionally long war by the standards of the 100 years war, the 80 years war, the 30 years war, the 7 years war, the wars of the roses, the wars, uh, the war of the Spanish succession, the Napoleonic, uh, the first series of Napoleonic campaigns, the second series of Napoleonic campaigns, and so on, and so forth, ad nauseum. Many people's impressions of how war works are formed by what they have observed in recent years, where the United States and NATO have, with overwhelming artillery and air power, taken on, quite frankly, little Arabs in sandals. And even those have not been all that short, really. The second mistake that people make in this regard is to assume that the Russian way of war is the same as the European way of war. We like to think in terms of strike and counter-strike and sweeping maneuver and so on. And I don't speak as a military tactician by any stretch of the imagination. But I've always been fascinated by history and warfare. I've watched the uh, famous BBC television series The World at War six times, including the the extra episodes, so 28 episodes, six times over the entire thing. And it's a well understood thing among people who are familiar with this subject. But that's not how Russians play this game. The way that Russians play the war game is to grind and grind and grind until there's nothing left of the enemy, and then to sweep on through, as they did in World War II. Therefore, it can safely be said that Russia is doing what Russia always does. There hasn't been some terrific holdup. They haven't tried to get it over and done with in a six-month period, or whatever the case may be. And it should be noted, if you consider, if you believe that uh, Russia has been taking too long with this war, that Russia's initial objectives were two oblasts, two provinces of Ukraine. That is to say, Luhansk and Donetsk. Russia now has almost total control of four provinces, four oblasts. oblasts. Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. And it appears as if it is going to move now into Mikhailovka and Odessa Oblast. But time will tell. The long and the short of it is that Russia is giving Ukraine a big hiding. And um, the NATO troops that have been discovered there have been on the receiving end of some severe punishment. Two groups of Polish mechanics, large groups, were taken out in two strikes on one day last week. 32 French soldiers were killed in one strike. Just this morning we learned that a, an operation being overseen, being led by the British Special Boat Services, landing on a spit, that is to say a, a narrow piece of land. Uh, the operation was absolutely taken out by the Russians. And uh, only one man from that entire 
team of Ukrainians and British Special Boat Services chaps uh, survived. Moving on to the Israel-Gaza conflict, I'm going to be very brief if you don't mind. I think that the safest thing to say is the truth is yet to come out. There has been a lot of speculation about the Israel-Gaza conflict. People have talked about the, the Menachem Begin Canal that the Israelis want to build. They've talked about the offshore crude oil uh, resources that have been discovered that Israel doesn't want the Gazans to have and wants to have for itself. There have been innumerable speculations on what really, really lies behind Israel's ferocious response to Hamas's invasion of the 7th of October last year. But I'd like to point out to you that Possibly nothing is quite what it seems. We know that the Israeli forces were semi-stood down on that day. For some reason there was a, a lowered risk level and there were fewer soldiers on duty than there always are. We also know that it took the Israelis over seven hours to respond. We know from former commanders of the security forces on that border, on the Gaza border, the Israeli Gaza border, Israeli border guards, if you like, that there were numerous procedural failures that they said indicated deliberation, premeditation. We've heard that from the lady who speaks so articulately all over social media, from two men, a number of sources, who've gone line by line through the apparent uh, inexplicable failure of Israel on that day. Now, it might be a stretch to say that this was an Israeli operation, but I'll remind you of two things. Number one, former Israeli president, former Israeli head of Mossad, former Israeli senior military commander, and the list goes on, who in interviews over time said, we founded Hamas. We founded Hamas from the seed to the tree. It is 100% a project of us, and the reason we did it was to control our own opposition. As long as we were going to have opposition, terrorists, Palestinians wanting to attack Israel, hating Israel, at least we should be the boss of that entity. And who also made the point, this is all on record, on numerous occasions, that we are so heavily infiltrated in Hamas that we know every single thing that they are doing. And you can look these interviews up, beloved friends. Which leads me to conclude with the following. As I began the subject, I don't think that we fully know what's cooking there. I think that what we're seeing on the surface is a far cry from the deep and hidden significances of that conflict. Now, last but not least, we've got the SA elections on the horizon. And probably the most interesting thing to talk about in this short video, which is now becoming a very long video, is the MK party. What do we know about MK? We know that it was founded by Jacob Zuma not long after a trip to Russia. We know that uh, Rob Hersov and I believe the man's name is Andre Pinar have alleged that the MK party was, is funded by Russia and the allegation is that it is a project of the GRU or GRU, that is to say Russian military intelligence. Now, 
That doesn't make any sense at all. In geopolitical terms, in geostrategic terms, BRICS is probably the very biggest thing happening in the world right now. Therefore, anybody who participates in BRICS is a bit like being married to the Mafia. Or a bit like being part of a Mafia family. If you come, you stay. You don't mess us around. So, if BRICS is so serious, and if the Russians and the Chinese, these, these heavyweight guys, these heavy hitters, are playing for keeps with BRICS, as they appear to be doing. Why would the Russians fund an opposition to a party to which they married? If you imagine BRICS as some sort of a, a marriage. And having given it a lot of thought, I mean, it would be destructive, wouldn't it? They would be undermining themselves. Here they are wedded to South Africa through the ANC in this enormously significant BRICS experiment, for want of a better word. Why would they now undermine the ANC? Why would they want to risk any fracturing, any vulnerability to the West in BRICS? As I say, having given it a tremendous amount of thought, I think... I'm not sure, but I suspect that the key to this door, if you imagine an enormous castle wall and a great big gate and a door, and it's also impregnable and impenetrable, but just one little key open, and you can see and experience and visit everything behind the wall and the gate and the door. The little key that works in this dilemma, the little key of explanation could be, seems to be, that the Russians are punishing the ANC for the unforgivable, unprecedented humiliation of not being willing to guarantee Vladimir Putin's safety and security, for want of a better word. Under pressure from the United States of America, you remember that, at the BRICS summit of the, uh, I think it began on the 31st of August of last year, if I'm not mistaken. I think that they're learning the hard way, that when you play with the big boys, they mean it, even if you don't. That's all for today, guys. Thank you for watching this video. It's good to be back. It's nice to be talking to you. I had some problems with my camera earlier, and I was speaking to um, Mr. Miller's wife about it, and I was really quite hard sore. I, it looked as if I wasn't going to be able to do the video because I couldn't figure out how to, how to sort it out. Um, uh, so yes, it's very nice to be back. Thanks for watching. Goodbye and God bless you.